last of uh, uh, probably 10 or 12 since I've been involved. And during that time, the cost of energy from, from wind in the last, say, 20 years has gone down by a factor of about five. So it's moved from something which was essentially smocks and sandals to something which is now competing directly with conventional, so-called conventional generation. And from an engineering point of view, that, that's a truly remar remarkable story. In, in wind, in turbine terms, it's gone from something about 12 meters in diameter to something about 120 meters in diameter in prototype stage. So we now have something with no fuel risk because uh, we have indigenous wind with clear costs. So the costs are the capital costs which uh, uh, you have to pay for building the thing and buying the turbines, a small operations and maintenance cost. So you have secure supply at a known cost. And that cost now, on a, in a purely cash basis, on a good side, is comparable to conventional generation. So the question is not what's the justification, the question is what's the justification for not using wind? A few years ago, the only thing anyone would have built uh, in Britain for power generation was gas turbines. The government took the view that was undesirable from the risks and from the environmental consequences. And uh, so they introduced a set of supports. Uh, and in particular, what the government wanted to do was to help build up uh, non-emitting power generation industries. Uh, wind energy has proved to be the front runner under those support schemes. Uh, and it's very clear, if you want industry to take big financial risks and build up new clean industries, there's got to be supports there. It is certainly true that there are, there are some special uh, deals for renewables which are clearly published and they are creating the market. Those will be there for some time in order to bring the full, to allow wind energy to realise its full potential. And they are actually there for uh, other sources as well. The difference now is that there is the beginnings of a costing of the environmental damage done by conventionals. So it may be health, may be damage to buildings, may be damage to the environment, maybe create storms, but there's something in there. And the logical thing to do is to sum together the cash cost uh, and the environmental cost and, and put them together in, in, in one package. Or, if you can't do that, to give an environmental cost benefit, so a uh, cash encouragement to clean forms of generation. So we should be looking at all of this generation in the round. We should be looking not just at cash, but at the total package. One of the really uh, attractive things about wind energy is, of course, it doesn't depend upon fuel supplies. Uh, once you've built it, the energy is free from the wind. Uh, that's a valuable asset to have, particularly when you have got a lot of uncertainty in fossil fuel prices. You've then got the environmental benefits as well. Um, this is the biggest non-emitting power source uh, of, of all the new entrants, if you like, the new technologies in power generation. Uh, and in a world where you know we've done all we can to scrub about other pollutants we've still got a big problem with climate change that makes it a very attractive option so you know there's, there's there's a lot going for wind energy the way the commission looks at this now in terms of the opportunities for the uk i hope we'll see lots of different sources of renewable energy coming on stream over the course of the next 10 years but to be quite honest when you look at some of the cost issues, you look at availability issues, you look at some of the engineering challenges, it is wind power that we need to maximise as fast as we possibly can in the shortest period of time. Onshore as well as offshore, I'm not one of those who thinks that we should shove the whole thing offshore and forget about the onshore industry. I think we need both really successfully pushing these technologies to the maximum. Well, I, th I think it's just nonsense uh, that uh, that a wind turbine is going to t to take a, an effect on tourism. I think it's actually going to enhance it. And we, of course, have this unique turbine that actually attracts tourists because they can have an intimate experience with it. So they can get rid of some of the fears they might have about wind turbines. Uh, we get people coming here um, who are probably very undecided as to whether they really want to support a wind turbine in their area and when they leave most of them have changed their mind. My point of view we've had people come into the information centre who own hotels and bed and breakfast places in the town and they've asked me for brochures for their customers because they've had a lot of questions about them and a lot of people come down here to, just to see the actual wind farm so don't worry at all is my answer. We get one or two people who think they're ugly, but that's all really. There was one or two concerns about the seals originally, but there's no concern now because the seals are still there. There's still the boat trips out to see them. 
Um, they were one or two people were worried about birds flying into them, into the turbines, but that hasn't happened. So really, there's no concerns whatsoever. The reliability of wind is often mentioned in relation to wind power. And to start asking or answering that question, you've really got to look at what the characteristics of the UK wind resource are. If we're talking about a single site, a single wind power development, then that development will generate electricity for around 80 to 85% of the time. So there is a small amount of time when the turbines are idle, no electricity is being generated. But this is only one location, and this doesn't reflect what's happening around the country. For the UK, wind power is developed in a range of locations, and it's extremely unlikely that you will find no wind at all of those locations at the same time. There are other aspects to the question as well. Not only does wind power vary, but electricity demand varies as well. And so we need to look at the relationship between electricity demand and the availability of wind power. And what we find is that on average, wind power provides about two and a half times more electricity when demand is high compared to times when demand is very low. And this matches the seasonal patterns. Wind power provides more electricity in winter and the UK has a substantially higher electricity demand in winter. It's true that the power from a, from a uh, wind farm is not continuous, but it's also true that it's quite easy to forecast and there are now quite a lot of activities of, uh, afoot developing forecasting techniques for wind farms. I actually think the, the, the word intermittent is wrong in, in its application to wind. It should be variable. It isn't intermittent, because intermittent is a binary thing, it's either on or it's off. So actually conventional power is intermittent and renewable energy is variable. Although the, 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 the normal concept of a conventional power station run by, by gas or coal or nuclear is the public's image is it's, it's there all the time and it's working. In fact, it's there for a lot of the time, but occasionally, and not that occasionally, I mean, re relatively frequently, it goes. So if you lose the whole of Sizewell B, uh, it's either there or it's not there. And it does go off, so does, the, so does the channel link. So conventional power is intermittent, renewable energy uh, is, is variable, and they both need to be looked at together in, in the same way, and that's possible to do statistically. And then I think if we do that, we get a very clear idea of the relative benefits of these two forms of generation. There are two ways of looking at the cost of energy from anything, and, and a wind farm is no exception. One is cash cost, which we're all familiar with. The other is energy cost. And the, the definition of, of energy cost is, well, how much energy does it take to make the thing? Uh, how much energy does it produce in its lifetime? And there was some suggestion that uh, a wind turbine does not repay what we call its energy debt, so the difference between those two numbers. And this is really just complete nonsense. Uh, on a good Welsh site or a good Scottish site, the uh, turbine will, will produce as much energy as, as was taken to make it in about six months or less. If you come further south to less windy places, clearly that goes up, but it might be a year in the south of England. So it, it's very much uh, a good payer of its debt. Building any wind farm is going to affect the, the local area. You're going to lose habitat and, and maybe actually displace birds. Um, and we think it's very important that that happens on, on places which aren't very important for birds to start with. So it's a big country. We need a lot more wind farms, but there are a lot of places to put those wind farms where they won't have a big impact on birds. I think what's going on is that different issues are jostling for people's attention in different time frames. There are some short-term worries that people have which sometimes look bigger than the very large time frames that we're dealing with around issues like climate change. People have concerns about bird strikes and a this very small number of birds that might be affected by wind farms, but you've got to compare that with the impacts on biodiversity if climate change hits the planet as we think it will. Well, the RSPB has objected to uh, 